Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new to the channel, make sure to hit that like, subscribe, and set your notification bell to all, that way you don't miss an upload, which tends to be three to four times a week. If you are interested in becoming a subscriber to the channel, all that information can be found down below. Without further ado, it is time to dive into today's video, which means it's time to go back to ashes. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Unsolved Mysteries Volume 14. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. Right before I read the first case, there will be an ad, and after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Warning, some of these cases may contain material not suitable for all. Listener discretion is highly advised. The Disappearance of Kyle Hancock Early Life Kyle Hancock was born in 1989. According to his personal Facebook account, he attended Parkside Collegiate Institute and had been employed by Formant Industries since 2021. The St. Thomas, Ontario, Canada native appears to enjoy playing guitar and spending time outdoors, with him sharing several photos of himself fishing and kayaking. Disappearance the exact date Kyle was last seen hasn't been confirmed, with reports varying between August 1st and August 2nd, 2023. What is known is that he was last sighted in St. Thomas. Since he went missing, Kyle's bank account hasn't been accessed, nor has his phone been active, with investigators noting a lack of connectivity to any network. Investigation very little information has been publicly shared regarding the investigation into Kyle's disappearance. The St. Thomas Police Service first published a media release about the case on September 27, 2023, with a second update shared on November 13. It's reported that several unfounded leads have been followed up on. On November 6, 2023, Investigators received a call from farmer Bill Walters, who came across Kyle's e-bike while harvesting crops from a field in the area of South Dell Line and Centennial Avenue in St. Thomas. One of the tires was flat, and the wires connecting to the battery were hanging loose. This prompted a search of the field, and Walters postponed his farm work. A few days later, Walter again uncovered an item belonging to Kyle. This time, it was his helmet. This prompted an additional search, which located the missing man's cell phone in a field at the corner of Southdale Line and Fairview Avenue, approximately two kilometers away. Searches of the surrounding area where the three items were found were aided by a search and rescue team from nearby London, Ontario. While the St. Thomas Police Service handles the official investigation, Kyle's family has been conducting their own search. They visited men's missions in nearby communities and have put up missing persons posters. Case Contact Information Kyle Hancock is described as a 34-year-old white male with a thin build, standing at 6 foot tall and weighing 157 pounds. He has short brown hair and blue eyes, his ears are pierced, and he has the word Dodge and the car company's logo tattooed on his upper right arm. At this point, investigators don't suspect foul play in the case. Anyone with information regarding Kyle's whereabouts is asked to contact the St. Thomas Police Service at 519-631-1224. Tips can also be submitted anonymously via Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-8477. The Disappearance of Brenda Gill Lampert Early Life Brenda Gail Lamper was born on December 26, 1969 in Williamson, West Virginia. 
From a large family of seven children, she was described as a free spirit who had a big heart and an outgoing spirit. A tomboy, she was playful and mischievous with a penchant for exploration. One of her favorite places to visit were the mountains that surrounded her, the town in which she grew up. While a smart girl, Brenda never had an interest in school and was allowed to drop out at 15 years old on the recommendation of her principal. In 1986, Brenda married Raymond Lampert, a co-worker of her brother, Tim. They were employed by the local chicken factory. While a devoted stay-at-home wife and mother of their two children, Kristen Raymond Jr., Brenda suffered regular abuse at the hands of her husband, with her family noting rings around her neck from him strangling her in frequent black eyes. On July 8, 1992, Brenda had filed a domestic violence complaint against Raymond with the Mercer County Sheriff's Office. While she dropped it two days later, there were signs their marriage was nearing its end. She'd scheduled an appointment with a divorce lawyer on July 30th, and Raymond had since moved out and was living with his parents at their 200-acre mountain property. Disappearance on July 26, 1992, Brenda held a birthday party for her infant son at her Blue Well, West Virginia home. Family and friends were invited, including Raymond, who'd brought the cake. According to attendees, there were noticeable tension between the pair, and it's speculated that the cause was the presence of Brenda's cousin, Tammy, who was having an affair with Raymond. Raymond left the gathering with the children at around 8 p.m., despite Brenda wanting Krista and Raymond Jr. to stay with her. By 9 p.m., the last of the guests had left the Windmill Hill Road property. The following series of events are based on witness statements, including Raymond. According to one of Brenda's sisters, Raymond stopped by her house the next day to say his wife had been missing since around midnight despite her personal belongings and car being left at the residence. He claimed to have called their mother, who'd promised to call Brenda, but it's unknown if one was made. Upon speaking with Raymond, two of Brenda's sisters drove to her home to see if everything was okay. They too noticed her car in the driveway, and while the front door was locked, they were eventually able to enter the residence where they found signs of the party the previous afternoon, but no Brenda. Depending on the source, either Brenda's family or Raymond were the ones to report her missing to the authorities. Fast forward to January 14, 1993, when another individual disappeared from the local area. Mark Anthony Cook was last seen walking towards U.S. Route 52 after leaving Pedro's Bar at the Airport Square Shopping Center at around 3 a.m. The 24-year-old, who was reported missing by his mother's boyfriend four days later, reportedly knew Brenda. Investigators believe the two cases could be connected with foul play suspected in both. Search Raymond was immediately considered a person of interest in Brenda's disappearance. When spoken to by investigators, he claimed his wife had run away with a man named Mike and abandoned him and the children. When asked if he'd had any involvement, he denied any wrongdoing. Brenda's aunt, Bonnie Patterson, was interviewed and recalled an interaction she had had with Krista who said that Raymond and her grandfather had been on and off the mountain around the time Brenda went missing. The Lampert family had owned a sawmill property, and when asked by investigators if they could search it, Raymond dodged the question. Tammy told investigators that she'd heard from Raymond's sister that he and his father had been at the sawmill the night Brenda went missing. Within a week of her disappearance, Tammy had moved in with Raymond, and the two eventually married. She believed her husband was innocent for a while, but he soon became abusive toward her. This, paired with Brenda's absence at major events in her children's lives, had since led her to question his version of events. Brenda's home was searched, and while everything appeared okay, 
It was noted that the bedroom was a mess and a suitcase had been packed. The latter was believed to be related to her pending divorce. Polygraph tests were conducted early on in the investigation, with one unnamed male suspect failing the one administered to him. A number of potential sightings of Brenda was reported soon after she went missing, with the most promising coming from a pawn shop in Princeton, West Virginia, and a grocery store in Bluewell. Unfortunately, none were proven to be the 22-year-old. In 2003, a tip came in which stated that Brenda and Mark's bodies may have been found in a pond off U.S. Route 52, about a half mile south of the Airport Square shopping center. Significant efforts were undertaken to confirm if their remains were there, including an attempted draining of the pond and the use of a diver and underwater radar and video equipment, but nothing was found. Brenda was legally declared dead in 2022. Her sister Christy had publicly stated that she believes the 22-year-old was murdered and her body hid on a property near Mercer County. The AWARE Foundation had since become involved in the search for Brenda. In 2023, the organization erected a billboard about the case along U.S. Route 52. Details Brenda Gill Lampert went missing from a residence on Windmill Hill Road in Bluewell, Mercer County, West Virginia, on July 26, 1992. She was 22 years old and was last believed to be wearing a short sleeve denim t-shirt, blue denim shorts, and black shoes. At the time of her disappearance, Brenda stood at 5'2 and weighed 110 to 115 pounds. She had curly shoulder-length black hair, blue eyes, pierced ears, dark-colored freckles on her shoulders, a birthmark on the back of her left leg, and a one-inch scar on her right wrist. She'd previously had her tonsils removed. Mark Anthony Tony Cook went missing from the Airport Square Shopping Center in Bluefield, Mercer County, West Virginia, on January 14, 1993. He was 24 years old and was last seen wearing a black t-shirt, a blue denim jacket with a drawing, and riding on the back, bleached blue jeans, black tennis shoes, and a white baseball cap. At the time of his disappearance, Mark stood between 5'5 five five and 5'9 five and weighed 135 to 140 pounds. He has brown hair and green eyes. While several sources, including the West Virginia State Police, have stated that the pair were in a relationship at the time of Brenda's disappearance, her family has since said they weren't that close. Case Contact Information Currently, both cases are classified as endangered missing with foul play suspected. Brenda's DNA and dentals are available for comparison against any human remains that may be found. Anyone with information about either disappearance is asked to contact the Mercer County Sheriff's Office at any of the four telephone numbers. 304-487-8364-304-487-8301-304-425-2274 or 304-487-8365. The Disappearance of Kiplin Davis Early Life Kiplin Davis was born in Provo, Utah on July 1, 1979 to Richard and Tamara Davis. Growing up, she was described as a social butterfly who was kind to everyone she met. She had a bright personality, which often led her to being the center of attention at social gatherings. At the time of her disappearance and presumed murder, Kiplin was a sophomore at Spanish Fork High School. Disappearance On the morning of May 2, 1995, Kiplin got into an argument with her parents and left to attend a driver's education class at the high school, located about eight blocks from her home. She subsequently attended her morning classes 
and was last seen sitting with her friends in a school cafeteria around lunchtime. Kipling didn't attend her fourth and fifth period classes, prompting the school to contact her parents. At 5 p.m., when she hadn't returned home at her usual time, Tamara and Richard reported their daughter missing to the Spanish Fork Police Department. Investigation Kipling's disappearance was initially treated as a runaway case, given her age and the fact she'd gotten into an argument with her parents that morning. This meant it took two weeks for them to issue a public plea for information. Richard and Tamara were quick to dismiss the possibility their daughter had run away, as she was happy with how life was going. She was close to getting her driver's license, and she was excited about her older sister's upcoming wedding. A search of Kipling's school locker found she left behind all of her personal belongings, including her retainer, school books, makeup, and purse. Not things the girl run away would forget to take with her. When spoken to, one of her friends initially claimed to have spoken to the missing 15-year-old between fourth and fifth periods, but he later changed his story. In the weeks following Kipling's disappearance, rumors began to spread alleging her body had been buried at a train tunnel in a nearby canyon and under a building. Reports also emerged regarding a possible sighting of her in a vehicle shortly after she was last seen at Spanish Fork High School. Unfortunately, none of these stories could be confirmed or dismissed. Within two months of Kipling going missing, the FBI became involved in the investigation. However, it wasn't until 2003 that progress would be made, thanks to the effort of U.S. Attorney Paul Warner. His deep dive into the case focused on the 15-year-old's classmates, Timmy Bent Olson, David Rucker Leifson, Scott Brunson, and Christopher Neil Jepson, and their friend Gary Blackmore. Olson, Brunson, Jepson, and Leifson were members of the Spanish Fork High School Drama Club, and they had claimed to have been in the auditorium on the day Kipling went missing. They said they'd been hanging lights for an upcoming performance. This story was discounted by a community choir that had been rehearsing in the room around the same time. None of the members had seen the four teenagers that day. Of the group, Olson was the one to come under suspicion the quickest. He'd given contradicting stories to investigators, and numerous witnesses later came forward to say he confessed to sexually assaulting and killing the 15-year-old, after which he hid her body in a canyon near Spanish Fork River. At least four even claimed he'd been sexually aggressive towards them. As a result of the renewed investigation, it's believed Kiplin was, our word that I can't use here, and murdered by people she knew, with Leifson and Olson alleged to have been the ones responsible. The other three are believed to have helped connect an alibi for the pair. The other three are believed to have concocted an alibi for the pair. In 2005, several indictments were filed against the group. April. Brunson was charged with perjury and lying to a federal agent. August. Blackmore was indicted on charges of perjury and lying to a federal agent. September. Olson was charged with 15 counts of lying to a grand jury. October, Jepson was charged with perjury and lying to a federal agent. November, Leifson was indicted on charges related to perjury. Jepson was convicted of four counts of perjury on September in 2007 and sentenced to five years in prison. He was later charged in relation to Kiplan's presumed murder, but reached a plea deal with the prosecutors pending no contest to obstruction of justice. In return, he could no longer be charged in connection to the 15-year-old's case. Brunson struck a deal in December of 2005, pleading guilty to six counts of perjury and lying to an FBI agent, while Blackmore made a similar deal and was sentenced to 13 months in prison. In 2011, the latter pleaded guilty to two more counts of perjury and was sentenced to 36 months probation.
Leeson and Olson were charged with Kiplan's murder on top of their other indictments. The former pleaded guilty to a single count of perjury and was sentenced to five years in prison, while the latter was tried and evicted of perjury and sentenced to 12 and a half years behind bars. He subsequently pleaded guilty to first-degree manslaughter in relation to Kiplan's death and was sentenced to another 15 years. Olson alleged he saw another person strike Kiplan on the head with a softball-sized rock, and that after he'd helped move her body to Spanish Fort Canyon. He refused to name the individual, only revealing that they were one of the other suspects who'd already pleaded guilty to perjury and has never said where Kiplan's body is located. This prevented him from being granted parole in 2021, with the Board of Pardons saying that he hadn't cooperated in good faith. The search for Kiplan remains active, in the aftermath of her disappearance, her younger sister, Carissa David Lords, set up the Find Kiplan Davis Facebook page, while her father wrote a book about the case titled, When an Angel Leaves Your Life. All money raised through its sales go toward a scholarship fund that was set up in his daughter's honor. Details. Kiplan Davis went missing from Spanish Fork High School in Spanish Fork, Utah County, Utah on May 2, 1995. She was 15 years of age and was last seen wearing an off-white crew neck with a beige stripe, a light blue denim vest with beige stripes, and a small designer tag. Dark blue bum equipment brand denim shorts, white Colorado brand leather sandals with cork soles and three stripes on the front and two around the heel a white hands brand bra, and royal blue underpants. She was also wearing two sterling silver rings, one in the shape of a flower and the other shaped like a shield with the letters CTR on it and flowers on either side. While she had pierced ears and was supposed to wear a retainer, she wasn't wearing it or earrings on the day she disappeared. At the time she went missing, Kiplan stood between 5'2 and 5'4 and weighed 110 to 120 pounds. She had a fair complexion with freckles and curly red or auburn hair that fell between her shoulder blades. Her eyes were light blue and she had a small birthmark on the back of her neck. Case Contact Information Kiplan's case is considered classified as a non-family abduction. DNA and dentals are available should her remains be located. Anyone with information is asked to contact the Spanish Fork Police Department at either 801-798-5070 or 801-804-4700. Tips can also be called into the FBI field office at 801-374-5332. The Disappearance of Barbara Cotton Early Life Barbara Louise Cotton was born on November 10, 1965, in Tioga, North Dakota, to Louise and John Cotton. The seventh of eight children, her parents divorced when she was just seven years old, leading her, Louise, and two of her siblings to relocate to Wilston, North Dakota. While strong-willed, Barbara was described as being quiet and soft-spoken. That being said, she wasn't a pushover. She worked at the country kitchen and was saving up to move into an apartment with a friend, Diane, when they both turned 16. She and her mother didn't always get along, and Barbara was looking for some space. Disappearance Barbara was last seen leaving the Cakes and Cones restaurant on Main Street in Wilston during the evening hours of April 11, 1981. She'd had dinner with her boyfriend, Stacy, and another person, possibly her mother. Following the outing, Stacy offered to walk Barbara home, but she declined. He watched her walk down Main Street to Recreation Park, at which point he lost sight of her 
The location was about five blocks from her residence. It's reported that Barbara may have also attended a party on the 18th Street apartment that same night. Louise reported that she'd spoken to her daughter after returning home from work at around 11 p.m. and that Barbara had said she'd planned to return home later that night and go to work in the morning. According to a court document filed by Louise, Barbara was last seen by a friend walking away from the Plainsman Hotel at midnight on April 12th. At 4 p.m. that afternoon, she called the Wilston Police Department to report her daughter missing. At around 1 p.m. on April 13th, Louise called the police again to inform them that Barbara may be with Stacy in room 205 at the Pioneer Hotel in Scobie, Montana. Officials searched the location and neither individual were there. Investigation Barbara's disappearance was originally investigated as a runaway case, meaning a missing persons report was filed for several days. Prior to her going missing, Barbara didn't take her paycheck or any of her personal belongings. Her brother, with whom she was very close, said she'd never discussed plans to leave home. No one in her family believed she would have just run away. The authorities now believe she may have been abducted, but there's little documentation as to the extent of the original investigation. Barbara's childhood friend, Sandy Evanston, remembered Louise calling her family's house in the early hours of April 12, 1981, asking if she'd seen her daughter. She later overheard Louise and her own mother discussing the case and learned the former had been the one to have attended dinner with Barbara and Stacy. Stacy left North Dakota for Montana within a day or two of Barbara's disappearance. While he was described by former classmates as a nice guy, his family said he was prone to violent outbursts. They also revealed that he'd been diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia after being discharged from the U.S. Navy. On July 15, 1981, Stacy was arrested in Malta, Montana for disorderly conduct. He hung himself in his cell in the early hours of the following morning. Several extensive searches have been conducted over the years, but none have located Barbara or any evidence of her whereabouts. The investigations have led Louise across the United States, and while her daughter's DNA have been tested against numerous Jane Doe's, there have been no positive results. In 2021, a billboard featuring Barbara's image and information about her disappearance was put up along U.S. Route 2, heading north through Williston. Details Barbara Louise Barb Cotton was last seen in Williston, Williams County, North Dakota, on April 11, 1981. When she went missing, Barbara was 15 years old, stood at 5'2", and weighed 100 pounds. She had brown hair and hazel brown eyes. She requires glasses. She was last seen wearing a blue pullover blouse, a light tan summer jacket, Wrangler brand jeans, and rust-colored suede loafers. Barbara's ears are pierced, and her left lobe is noticeably lower than her right. Her teeth were said to be in good condition with the metal fillings and several molars. She has a pronounced S curve in her spine, which causes her to walk with a limp, and there's a mole on her upper right side of her chest. Like many her age in 1981, she smoked cigarettes. Case Contact Information Barbara's case is currently classified as endangered missing. Her dentals and mitochondrial DNA are available for comparison. Anyone with information regarding Barbara's disappearance is asked to contact the Williston Police Department at 701-577-1212. The Disappearance of Bethany Markowski Early Life Bethany Markowski was born on February 1, 1990 to Johnny Joe Carter and Larry Markowski. 
The pair each had two children from previous relationships, meaning Bethany was their fifth and youngest child. By all accounts, she was a sweet yet sassy girl who was known for loving nature. In January 2001, Larry and Johnny separated, as the former was abusive and controlling. He'd allegedly abused Bethany and her siblings, and two family members had accused him of sexually assaulting them. A classmate of Bethany's claimed she'd alleged the same thing, saying she'd confided in them that her dad also touched her inappropriately. Knowing she had to flee the situation, Johnny took Bethany while Larry was at work and moved in with her sister Lori, her husband and their three children in Hemmertage, Tennessee. Upset, Larry abducted Bethany from her new school, prompting Johnny to obtain a protection order against him. As part of their custody agreement, Larry was allowed unsupervised weekend visits with Bethany. He was also allowed to call her on Tuesday and Thursday evenings between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m. Disappearance In early March 2001, Bethany spent several days with her father at his home in Gleason, Tennessee. On March 3rd, she called Johnny and told her she and Larry were planning to go ice skating the next day. At 9.38 a.m. on March 4th, Bethany called Johnny again, asking if she'd be picking her up later that day and letting her know that Larry knew she had a new boyfriend. Given the protection order, Johnny wasn't able to pick up her daughter, but she reassured Bethany that her aunt and uncle would be meeting her at 5 p.m. that evening in Waverly, Tennessee. According to Larry's friend, Harold, he and Bethany spent time at his residence in Little Rock, Arkansas, after which they hit the road to return to Tennessee. Sometime between 1.30 p.m. and 3.30 p.m., they stopped at Old Hickory Mall in Jackson, with Larry telling the authorities that Bethany had wanted to visit Claire's and go to the shopping center's game room. While she did this, he allegedly took a nap in the car. Waking up approximately 30 minutes to one hour later, Larry found Bethany hadn't returned and entered the mall to look for his daughter. When 5 p.m. came and went, Lori called him, and it took several attempts for him to answer the phone and informed her that her niece was missing. At 5.15 p.m., Larry informed mall security that he couldn't find Bethany, prompting them to get involved in the search. By 6 p.m., they contacted the Jackson Police Department to report the 11-year-old missing. Investigation Immediately, investigators looked at surveillance footage from Old Hickory Mall, but they were unable to find Bethany, meaning there's no proof she actually entered the shopping center on that day she went missing. The Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, or TBI, was brought in to aid the investigation on March 6, 2001. Larry has stated he wasn't involved in his daughter's disappearance, despite investigators questioning his version of events. When they spoke to Harold, they learned Larry had said he'd wanted to take Bethany to Mexico, allegations the latter denies. Larry pointed the finger at Johnny, but there's no evidence she was involved. Both parents haven't been ruled out, but Johnny did pass a lie detector test, while Larry did not. He's also not been very cooperative with the investigation. Several witnesses came forward to say they saw Bethany with an unidentified female in the weeks following her disappearance. The woman who looked unkempt and disheveled was described as such. White, between 42 and 44 years of age, five foot four to five foot five, 185 pounds, brown eyes with dark circles underneath, frizzy blonde hair that appeared clean but had noticeable damage. Given her state, it's believed she may have been recovering from a hangover at the time the witness saw her. According to authorities, the unidentified female may have attempted to enroll Bethany in a private school in Sweetwater, Tennessee, in April of 2001, without any records. She'd allegedly claimed to be the 11-year-old's aunt and had said her father would bring in the necessary documentation. 
However, school officials never saw her after this initial encounter. While unconfirmed to be the same pair, witnesses claimed to have seen the young woman and a girl resembling Bethany at a cafe in Cleveland, Tennessee. They were at the establishment across several days with the former, who was noticeably irritable, using a payphone to call someone multiple times a day. Investigators have revealed Larry was supposed to deliver products to the same cafe, but his truck had broken down, meaning he arrived three days late. The last reported sighting of the pair was at a bus depot, with the one they boarded bound for Moline, Illinois. Investigators searched the depot in Moline, but they were unable to find the woman nor the young girl who was reportedly with her. In 2016-2017, Johnny received a call from the TBI about a girl found passed out on the front porch of a resident in Knoxville, Tennessee. When found by the home's owner, she would claimed to be Bethany Markowski. While she had identifying marks to the missing girl, DNA ultimately proved she wasn't her. Over the two decades Bethany had been missing, thousands of tips have been called into investigators. As of April 2024, one had been called in that's currently being looked into by the FBI. Details. Bethany Leanne Markowski allegedly went missing from Old Hickory Mall in Jackson, Madison County, Tennessee on March 4, 2001. But she was last seen in Little Rock, Arkansas. She was 11 years old when she went missing. At the time of her disappearance, Bethany had shoulder-length brown hair with bangs and either blue or green eyes. She stood between 4'8 and 5 foot and weighed around 95 to 100 pounds. She has a mole on her left breast and freckles on her cheeks and nose. She was still losing her baby teeth at the time she went missing, with her top and bottom molars absent. On the day she was last seen, Bethany was wearing a green t-shirt, blue or black jeans, and black slip-on shoes. Case Contact Information Bethany's case is currently classified as endangered missing. Anyone with information regarding the case is asked to contact the Jackson Police Department at 731-425-8400. Tips can also be called into the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation at 1-800-824-3463 or the Memphis Field Office of the FBI at 901-747-4300. The Disappearance of Gretchen Fleming Early Life Gretchen Fleming was born on December 24, 1984, in Warrington, Virginia. Her parents divorced when she was a child, with her and her sister living full-time with their father, David, in Parkersburg, West Virginia. When she was around 14 years old, Gretchen's father met and married a woman named Jennifer, who became her stepmother. She had two twins from a previous relationship, and it wasn't long before she and David had a child of their own. Growing up, Gretchen was very close to her father, with David saying they had an open line of communication. She was described as a free spirit who was very involved in extracurriculars, whether that be clubs, sports, or church. She was also known to be an avid reader with a passion for music, writing, and travel. Following her graduation from Parkersburg High School, Gretchen wasn't sure what she wanted to do with her life. She moved to North Carolina, where she studied political science at university and held down a couple of odd jobs. She eventually met someone and moved to Charleston, where she lived for about a year before they went their separate ways. According to her family, the breakup put Gretchen in a bad place a feeling only made worse by the death of her mother around the same time. She subsequently returned to West Virginia, where she moved in to her grandparents' home in Vienna, near Parkersburg. 
She got a job at the H&M store in Grand Central Mall with aspirations of possibly becoming a flight attendant. Disappearance. On December 11, 2022, Gretchen's grandmother Louise went to Jennifer and David's house to tell them she was worried about her granddaughter, whom she hadn't seen or spoken to since December 3rd. She said she dropped the 27-year-old off at work that afternoon, at which point Gretchen told her she wouldn't be home that night as she was planning on going out with friends after her shift. Initially, Louise wasn't worried when she hadn't heard from Gretchen in the days that followed, as it was common for her to couch surf with friends for a few days at a time. However, when it had been a week with no communication, she knew something was wrong. This feeling was only further elevated when David and Jennifer couldn't reach their daughter. The pair decided to drive around Parkersburg and visit local bars, hoping there'd be someone who recalled seeing Gretchen the night of December 3rd. When they visited the Front Row Sports Bar at 4000 Emerson Avenue, they met a bartender who recalled seeing her that evening. What's more, she said a friend had dropped off Gretchen's purse, which still contained her cell phone, her debit card and credit cards, her ID, and her tablet. The bartender also said she'd left with a man. After running into some of her friends, Gretchen's parents learned she'd gone to My Way Lounge on Juliana Street after her time at Front Row. The pair drove to the establishment where a DJ said he'd seen her there with a man named John. When they returned home, David and Jennifer charged her cell phone and saw the last time she had any communication with someone which was December 3rd. They then started calling her contacts, asking if anyone had seen her since that night, but came up empty. On December 12, 2022, the pair filed a missing persons report with the Parkersburg Police Department. Investigation. Right off the bat, the Parkersburg Police Department took Gretchen's disappearance seriously. They kicked off their investigation by calling local hospitals and shelters, and they checked their own systems to see if officers had come into contact with her. The authorities also posted about the case on social media, prompting John to contact them. According to him, he and Gretchen had begun their night at Front Row, after which she suggested they head to My Way Lounge for karaoke. Later that night, he went to look for her in the establishment, but couldn't find her. This prompted him to look around the immediate downtown area. When he couldn't locate her, he returned to the lounge to see if she was still there. Unable to locate Gretchen, John returned to his residence. He returned to Front Row the next day, as the 27-year-old had left her purse in his car and he figured she'd return to the sports bar to collect it, as it was one of her favorite spots to frequent. Investigators saw how concerned John was for Gretchen's well-being, noting that he felt bad because he'd been the one to take her to My Way Lounge. Given this and how cooperative he's been, neither they nor Gretchen's parents believed he had any involvement in her disappearance. On December 13, 2022, the owners of My Way Lounge contacted David to say they'd collected surveillance footage from the night Gretchen was there and that he was more than welcome to view it. It showed Gretchen sitting at the end of the bar alone while John was a few seats over, talking to another group of people. At some point, a man with white hair walked out of the gambling room and approached her. The pair then went back into the room where they spent approximately 30 minutes. It was noted that the 27-year-old appeared to be heavily intoxicated by this point in the night. Gretchen and the man eventually left the lounge together while John was in the bathroom and headed toward the northern parking lot, which is out of reach of the cameras. The next thing the surveillance system caught was a black Nissan Rogue sports SUV driving away. The vehicle had a missing license plate, 
a Pittsburgh Penguins license plate cover and OBX sticker on the upper right side of the back window and Darth Vader stickers on both sides. The owners of My Way Lounge were able to identify the person seen leaving with Gretchen as Preston Pierce. It's since been reported by local news stations that the 55-year-old, who used to go by the name Daryl Lott, is a former law enforcement officer whose career spanned 12 years. He'd worked at various police departments across West Virginia, the last in Barber County, and had since obtained employment as a fast food delivery driver. Having gotten the surveillance footage themselves, investigators brought Pierce in for questioning the following day. While he admitted to speaking with Gretchen and offering her a ride, he said he dropped her off downtown. Upon learning that Gretchen may have been dropped off in downtown Parkersburg, local police canvassed for additional surveillance footage, allowing them to better put together a timeline of the 27-year-old's last known movement on the morning of December 4th, 3.10 a.m. Pierce and Gretchen leave My Way Lounge and walk towards his car. There's no footage showing them entering the vehicle, as the parking lot is located in a blind spot. A black Nissan Rogue, believed to be Pierce's vehicle, exits the parking lot via an alleyway and drives toward 6th Street. The sports SUV is caught driving down Ann Street toward Pierce's residence on Division Street. It should be noted that at no time does any of the footage show Gretchen being dropped off downtown. Given the inconsistencies between Pierce's story and the collected surveillance footage, three search warrants were executed on his home and electronics, his vehicle and a storage unit under his name. Anything deemed to be potential evidence was bagged and sent away for forensic testing. There have been no updates regarding the results of these tests. While investigators didn't initially reveal Pierce's identity, they referred to him simply as a person of interest. His name was ultimately discovered by the media. This prompted a host of women to come forward to say he'd harassed and stalked them after obtaining their phone numbers through his job as a fast food delivery driver. In January 2023, it was misreported by a news outlet that Gretchen's body had possibly been found in a nearby river. That same month, police received a tip that her body may have been put down a 25-foot well in Ravenswood, West Virginia, about 45 minutes from Parkersburg. Investigators drained the well and searched the surrounding area, but there was no sign of the missing woman. That February, a community search was held at Mount Wood Park, approximately 30 minutes from where she was last seen. The following month, another was conducted at Johnson T. James Park in Parkersburg. The last public update in the case came in March of 2023, when investigators revealed that additional search warrants had been executed since the original three were conducted. The Parkersburg community had rallied together to raise awareness for Gretchen's disappearance and support her family. T-shirts and signs have been made and several vigils were held. A billboard was also put up on Murdoch Avenue featuring her image and information about her disappearance. Investigators are still actively looking into Gretchen's case. That being said, Pierce has stopped communicating with them. Details. Gretchen Eve Fleming was last seen leaving the My Way Lounge at 501 Juliana Street in Perkinsburg, West Virginia, in the early hours of December 4, 2022. She was 27 years old at the time of her disappearance. Gretchen stood between 5 foot and 5 foot 2 and weighed around 100 to 125 pounds. She had brown hair and brown eyes, and there's a tattoo of a world map on her upper back. Case Contact Information 
There's currently a $100,000 reward available for information leading to Gretchen's whereabouts and the conviction of the person or persons responsible for her disappearance. Anyone with information regarding the case is asked to contact the Parkinsburg Police Department at either 304-424-1072 or 304-424-8444. And that, dear listeners, is going to bring a close to these True Unsolved Mysteries, Volume 14. Before I go any further, I would like to give a very special shout out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Patty's niece, Christy Elias, Anita V, Donna, Les Crispin, Samantha Place, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Denise Sess, Tina Mead, Tammy Slayton, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Amy Klimko, and Haunted. Again, I cannot show enough gratitude and love for you all being the pillars of this channel. To the other subscribers, for the first timers, or the peekers in the back, Thank you all so much for your support, for without you, I don't have a voice, and Back to Ashes would not exist. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed these cases. Until next time, please stay vigilant and take care out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.